Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. Before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I am continuing to color the digital stamps that I got from the Tiddly Inks Digi Stamp Shop. I'm using Copic markers. They've been printed on my laser printer in toner so that it doesn't smear. Um, this is part two to our Nebraska story. And just as a recap, the players in our story are a man named John who happened to be um, quite a successful um, entrepreneur, let's call him. He was a gambler who was really good at running a casino. He eventually settled down and married a woman named Monday, who was a less successful at being married. Her first husband, she divorced when he was incarcerated. Her second husband moved her to Lincoln, Nebraska, and divorced her on grounds of infidelity. And John married Mary after they had begun a relationship and she told him that he needed to marry her or she was not returning from their little trip to New Orleans. Um, at some point in time, they took a trip to Buffalo, New York. John came back alone. Mary got a new boyfriend while she still had a husband. And then eventually came back to Nebraska, bringing her new friend with her. And that was the end of... 1890. In the beginning of 1891, John was murdered. And so we are kind of picking up today in the middle of the investigation as to who may have wanted to kill John. Keep in mind that he was both liked and disliked in town. He had a financial arrangement with the law to ignore the goings-on at his casino. His casino was built directly across from the courthouse area of town. And there was a town um, law requirement, regulation, I guess is a better word, that required the gambling casinos to be outside of the downtown premises. And he flaunted that. And there were people who, who wanted him to not succeed. And it appears that maybe that those people included his wife. Um, the man who was described as having attacked John was later caught um, because his description, the description fit a man named Monday. Monday was a barber in the area of town where John's casino had been. And when we left off last week, we were talking about Mary's or Monday's confession about his relationship with Mary. So we're just going to jump on in here today. I really hope you go and watch the first part of the story because it's interesting. And it was just getting to be too long to do in one video. So while Monday is being questioned by the police, there are other police out still doing the investigating. Um, these police were told by other witnesses that Mary also was still visiting her friend named Harry that followed her back from New York. Sometimes she would visit him disguised as a man, but the more comfortable she got in visiting his part of town, the less she took to, descri to disguise herself. She um, went from disguising herself as a man to... Dressing as a woman, but maybe more like a prostitute than an upper middle class woman. She was observed talking to him openly, taking him gifts, including a diamond ring, staying at his home, his residence, for considerable periods of time. So probably long past what would be considered genteel visiting, right? She openly strolled with him in public, which was a very intimate thing to do at that time. And... As this affair or alleged affair continued, Mary began to talk to her husband about divorce. Now, this is according to other witnesses. 
according to Mary, anytime she brought up the word divorce, John would be thrown into a jealous rage and then treat her really badly, threaten to kill her. He, um, she said he would place her under surveillance and then at one point imprisoned her in her home. She wasn't allowed to go anywhere. Um, Mary, this is something that Mary had confided in, confided to Monday about. Um, Monday continued to be her confidant. He was her um, hairdresser. He was coming to her home once a week under the direction of her husband, John. And as they became more and more friends, um, she confided in him more and more often. And eventually that relationship became sexual. Like it always does, right? Um, as an offer of evidence, Monday showed the police a locket containing her hair, which was the thing. It's very Victorian to have a locket of somebody's hair, your lover's hair. Um, he claimed, however, that he would never engage in criminal activities. But he did admit that he was unable to fend off her advances and their liaison went on for months, even though she continued to see Harry and be very open and reckless about that affair. So according to Monday, Mary eventually formulated a plan for him to murder her husband. According to Monday, Mary offered to pay him $15,000 from John's estate, which was to be worth, said to be worth about $200,000. He said he balked when she offered that to him, but then she threatened to tell her husband and the police of their affair if he refused. So that threat um, had implications that um, Monday probably understood in a different light because Monday was a black man and he was having an affair with a white woman. And even, even though the civil war was passed, even though this is the 1890s, there would really have been repercussions to him and his business. If that came to light, he was having an affair with a married woman and a white woman at that. So according to Monday, there were two attempts made to kill John and both of those attempts failed. So Mary decided to ensure the success of the third attempt. He claimed by slipping poison into her husband's stricken coffee. Now, it doesn't sound like Monday actually appeared to, to confess to attacking John, but being aware of Mary slipping something into his coffee the night of the attack. So after Monday's confession... John's body was exhumed and another autopsy was conducted and it indicated internal bleeding and the presence of a poison, which did confirm Monday's story. Mary was then arrested and held at Melik. He is the marshal held at Melik's residence at one of the hotels because there was not a jail available for women in the county. Harry Wallstrom, the friend from New York, the um, other lover of Mary was arrested as an accessory to murder and held at a different hotel um, under um, guard. So after the second autopsy, a coroner's jury concluded that the case against Mary, Monday, and Harry was sufficient to bring charges against them. So the reason this story got quite long is because the court case is kind of very detailed in the documentation I found, but also incredibly important. On January 26th, 1891, so this is just, you know, about 15 days after the attack on John, Mary and Monday were arraigned and charged to be held on three counts each of first degree murder and one count each of accessory to murder. Harry was charged with four counts of accessory but later the charges against him were dropped because there was no evidence that he was involved in this um, conspiracy. So eventually the jail situation was sorted out and Mary and Monday sat in one in a city jail, one in a county jail while they were arraigned and they were held without bail on charges of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit. So 
While they are in jail, various lawyers are scrambling to carry out investigations of their own to put together defense strategies so that they could offer their services to both Mary and Monday. Monday was visited by a number of lawyers in the first few days of his incarceration in the city jail. At the time of the arraignment on the 28th, Monday appeared with two lawyers, a, a Mr. Billingsley and a Mr. Philpot. Um, these two men had two years previously acted as Monday's attorneys when he was charged with, an, with assault. And that crime had resulted in, or that prosecution, that trial had resulted in a, not a conviction, in an acquittal against Monday or for Monday. So Monday hired the same lawyers. Mary hired um, Mr. Strode and Mr. Stearns. These two men were John's longtime attorneys. Um, but given that he was not necessarily a criminal and he was more of a businessman, that did not seem like the wisest strategy. So just before the case opened, Mary took her uncle's advice and added a family friend, a judge from Boise City, Idaho, to her de defense team. So while all of this is happening, John's brother, a man named Dennis Sheedy, who himself was a prominent banker and capitalist in the Denver, Colorado area, came to town with an interest in pursuing and prosecuting his brother's alleged murderer. Eventually, Dennis hired two private lawyers, a Mr. Hall and a Mr. Lambertson, to assist the county attorney, a Mr. Snell, in prosecuting the case. Snell was a reform advocate, one of the groups of people who were opposed to John's business and the location of John's business and just kind of not really the, the attorney that might be all gung-ho about finding his murderer. There were times when these reformationists actually had got into altercations with John, physical altercations in his own businesses. So I suppose that Dennis wasn't sure that this prosecutor was going to um, try really hard to find the murderer of somebody who was a, his public adversary. On January 20th, the coroner assembled another coroner's jury to inquire the cause of death of John. So they have already established that he was killed, and now they are going to try to figure out in how. So the, the coroner's inquiry um, lasted a few days, and the crowd had gotten so large that the last few days of the hearings were shifted from the county or the city council chambers rather to the county commissioner's office because the there were so many people that were damaging the courtroom. So that's, that's a huge amount of people, which is uncommon. There's usually not that many people involved in a coroner's inquest. Um, anyway, the arrest of Monday McFarland two days before this this particular coroner's inquest and his public subsequent, oh my goodness, words are hard, subsequent confession that, Im that implicated Mary in the murder was the um, focus of the interrogation of the defendants. So this particular coroner's inquest is to determine um, the exact how each of the defendants are involved and um how the how the murder was convicted or committed um so there were a lot of other witnesses called on um because monday's confession was now the driving theory behind the investigation and is therefore the main theory of the prosecution itself but there's problems with mary's or with monday's confession rather um, so there, there's tons of details on this trial and I have all those links down below. You can read it if yourself, if you want, but when Mary was asked to testify, she came in with her lawyer, Mr. Strode, and 
when his presence was questioned, because this is not a trial, this is the coroner's inquest, he remarked that he was there to protect his client's interest and prevent her from incriminating herself. And after a bit of, you know, legal wrangling, Mary took the stand but refused to answer any questions. Um, Monday's lawyers would not let him take the stand to explain how he was involved in this case at all. So, after this preliminary evidentiary hearing, which lasted several days, and in which they repeatedly referred to Monday's confession, the judge decided that there was, in fact, sufficient evidence to um, indicate a cooperation and that the confession was valid, and both Mary and Monday should be charged with murder and accessory to murder. So both pled not guilty, and then they were sent back to jail again without bail. So the, comp the completion of this preliminary hearing um, sent them back to jail, and they sat. Monday and Mary stayed in jail while the county attorney, the prosecuting attorney, put together his case and got ready to call for a jury. So keep in mind, this is the end of January. On February 27th, a whole month later, and admittedly, um, trials happened a lot faster then than they do now. But a month later, Mary's attorney, Mr. Strode, entered the court, entered a, a complaint with the court about the delays and demanded that his client either, her trial either begin or that she be released on bail until the county attorney got around to abiding by the law, was his statement. The judge decided to give the prosecutor more time, but the delays continued, and finally the judge ruled that the prosecutor had to file charges by March 12th, so we're into the whole middle of March now, by 3 p.m., or he would grant them both bail. So Mr. Snell was, was basically forced to formally file um, against both defendants and did so on March 12th, 1891. So just, he went to the last minute. They were formally charged with six separate counts of first degree murder, accessory to murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Um, on a spring morning in May, May, 1891, which was a long time then for a trial to be pushed back. Um, Judge Field called the court to order and there was a pretty decent sized audience in the courtroom. The judge instructed the bailiff to um, call everybody to order and jury selection began. And potential jurors were quizzed by both lawyers or lawyers on both sides and by both sets of defense attorneys. And there was a lot of back and forth be before the jury was eventually selected. Now, the decision was made to have Mary and Monday tried together in one trial. And this had both pros and cons. The defense hoped that if the case against either defendant was weak, both would be acquitted. The prosecution recognized that this was a risk that they were taking, uh, allowing them to be tried together, because if one was guilty, the other was guilty. So they kind of were playing both sides of the same coin, right? The case against Monday, based on his confession, was strong. But the case against Mary had very little evidence. And what evidence they did have, minus the confession, was very circumstantial. So the prosecution felt that it was in the state's best interest to try them together and let Monday's confession have more weight against Mary. Now, the evidence, circumstantial evidence against Mary focused on her unhappy marriage to John, her extramarital relationship with Harry and Monday, and the evidence, the witnesses that were called testified that Mary was having open re an open relationship, like a public relationship with Harry, and other witnesses testified that they saw Mary and Monday together near John Sheedy's house just before the murder. And then there was this, this whole poisoning. So if you remember, John was hit in the head with a cane, 
which caused him to crack open his skull. The doctors, in, there were two doctors that were local to the area, came and wrapped him up. They gave him one dose of pain medication. And later that night, Mary had given him some sleeping powders and coffee to ensure that he would get a good night's sleep. Now, we know now sleep is the worst thing for a concussion. But the coroner's inquest indicated that John had been poisoned. So the implication then is that only two people could have poisoned John. Either the doctors gave him more morphine than he should have had, which there were two doctors in the room, and that was quickly dismissed. But the, the powders, the sleeping powders that Mary put in John's coffee were, were either not sleeping powders or it was way too heavy of a dose. So this is the, the evidence against Mary outside of Monday's um, confession. So the prosecution brought forth several witnesses that backed up their story. Witnesses to the affairs, witnesses to the unhappy marriage, witnesses to Mary and Monday together, witnesses of Mary's behavior before and after she had given John the sleeping powders. There were all kinds of witnesses brought in to bolster up the prosecution's evidence against Mary. When the defense had its turn, they argued that Monday's so-called confession was a problem, and it was. So Monday actually gave his confession twice. Once, late at night, under duress, um, Officer Kennedy, one of the officers whose name all of a sudden I can't remember, oh my gosh, my brain turned off, threatened him, you might remember this from last week, threatened him that there was a mob outside ready to kill him and that he would only be saved if he confessed. And the only person that heard that confession was this policeman. The next morning, the policeman took Monday into the judge's chambers where the judge, the Marshal McKinley, the stenographer, and the prosecution all heard and recorded Monday's confession. So the defense argued that that confession should be thrown out because it was not given freely. The legal argument was that this confession was given under duress and was therefore not, couldn't even be counted as truth. You know, it's, it's a, a, a legal, a well-used legal argument that any confession, you know, that's given under du du duress has to be considered false because people will say anything to get out of trouble. Um, and there are laws now that deal with exactly how confessions can be extracted. Now, it is also okay for police to lie in order to elicit a confession, but a white policeman telling a black man that there was a mob ready to hang him is probably, is not probably, is way beyond just a lie that is complete duress. So the prosecution argued that the two confessions were different um, and the circumstances were different and that if Monday did not feel the same duress the next morning in the judge's chambers, he could have rescinded his confession. He could have said, nope, I was lying, I was scared, and he didn't. So the state or the county attorney, the prosecution, argued the fact that because Monday gave the same confession the next morning, it was valid because the threat no longer existed. So there was a little bit of a gray area about this confection. Oh my God, I keep saying confection. Confession, sorry. Oh my goodness sakes. Ugh. Anyway, when the prosecution and defense finally rested their case, the judge reiterated that although the defendants were tried together, each case should be considered separately. So he did tell them they could find one guilty and not the other. He carefully instructed the jury not to consider Monday's confession against Mary as evidence, and he clarified the definition of circumstantial evidence. So the judge is giving the jury all the information they need to come to a proper legal conclusion, apparently. So late on May 28th, the jury went to deliberation. Um, the following afternoon, the jury returned with a verdict. 
that verdict not guilty on all counts for both defendants. Spectators in the courtroom and standing outside exploded into cheers, um, but also they were not all happy cheers. Some people were pleased that Mary had and Monday had not been convicted, but some people were not happy about that. The press proclaimed the decision a miscarriage of justice and expressed concern that even the legal system was corrupt, which they're kind of not wrong because John was literally paying the police and a judge not to shut down his casino. I'm just saying they weren't exactly wrong. <laughs> Um, but even as the shock swept through Lincoln society and the legal community, something in the response seemed um, not right. Not only was it unclear who had murdered John, it was also quite unclear what had transpired in the prosecution. And then the prosecution became... Well, there became a suspicion that the prosecution had not done what they needed to do to, to elicit a conviction. Most people agreed that Mary had probably murdered her husband. In fact, very few people said she didn't. The big thing that seemed to have been the public um, chatter was why the prosecution hadn't tried harder to convict Mary. Why hadn't she tried her separately? Why hadn't he tried her separately? So, and, and it all came back to the fact that this Mr. Snell was an adversary to John and his business and his style of businesses and specifically their location right in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska, right across from the courthouse, right across from the law. So there was a lot of speculation that the um, prosecution did not do its job, but I didn't read anything where people said Mary was not responsible for her husband's death. So, you know, it's kind of crazy. Anyway, back to the story. The day after his acquittal, Monday dressed in a new suit of clothes and left town to visit his mother in Kansas. His whereabouts after that are unknown. And as many expected, he never returned to Lincoln. Like, I don't know that I would either. I mean, holy cow, that's crazy. Mary, the day after her trial, stayed at an apartment her sister had rented um, and enjoyed her first day of freedom since January. So she was in jail from the time she was arrested until the murder or until the trial. She was visited by many friends and spoke freely about the trial, disparaging the prosecuting attorneys and some of the press who later who labored to quote convict her in print. Um, so she's basically. Um, taking court, right? She's got all her friends coming in to visit her. She's claiming the prosecution did a terrible job and that the, the press is out to convict her. She's definitely playing the victim. After resting, she visited her sick mother in Illinois and a while later, she returned to Lincoln. However, she re refused to return and live in the Sheedy house, Sheedy, S-H-E-E-D-Y. I'm not swearing. I promise you to. John's house. She refused to live in that nice house that he had built just before they married. She sold it later that year and was following in a, or was living in a set of, of um, rented rooms on O Street. So just a little bit away from this house that was built on P Street. And she was listed, she was registered in these rented rooms as widow of John. So she's still using his name. She's still claiming his um, property. Residents passing by that empty house would claim that they heard noises coming from inside the house and that the house was haunted. So later in 1892, Mary left Lincoln and married a man named Max Bruce, who was a traveling salesman for the American Tobacco Company out of San Francisco. On March 1st, 1893, using the name Mary Bruce and in need of money, that's a quote, like you can see my fingers doing air quotes, she actually sued her husband's estate for a larger monthly allowance. She had was currently being given $83.33. Um, her her brother-in-law was the one who was in charge of the estate. Women did not get to handle that back in those days. 
unless you're in Wyoming by that time, then you could. <laughs> the county court actually ruled against her and she appealed. The judge dismissed the case, declaring that Mary had already helped herself to the household furniture, a horse and a buggy and $500 cash, and that she had, therefore, already received an amount to, quote, which she was entitled by law. In, um, by 1900, Max Bruce had settled down as a storekeeper, and soon thereafter, the couple apparently left San Francisco, and according to one source, it's not really known where. So there was a lot of um, backlash that happened, or things that happened because of the, tri the murder of John Sheedy and failure of the prosecution to convict anybody. The reformers were emboldened by in their cause to then include social as well as political reform in their platform. The, um, there were several progressive organizations founded in 1892 and 93, and with calls for um, reformation in state and city government. The railroads highlighted some of the conflicts of interest that, that were happening um, because the, the railroad men were kind of doing the same thing that John was doing, paying the, the law to look the other way. The financial crash of 1893 really devastated Lincoln, Nebraska. Many companies that were there were forced into bankruptcy and thousands were out of work, which meant nobody was gambling anymore anyway. The street was very quiet. And people um, then started thinking, considering more the, con the corruption of the system. And so another great wave of reformation um, in the municipal and state governments um, swept ac across Lincoln, Nebraska, opening a whole new chapter in the city's history. So even though the timing of John's murder and the resurgent of reform may be um, coincidental, it is n n possible that... John's murder was the, the point of no return. It, it had something had to be done. In the mid 1890s, after years and years of growth, the core groups of Lincoln's booster culture, the Union Club, the Chamber of Commerce, they all suffered waves of departures and resignations. For more than 10 years, the city changed in personnel, there were declining memberships in, in these social agendas, and it just kind of changed the way that the city of Lincoln operated. But that was not just um, happening in Lincoln, Nebraska. That kind of reform was happening, happening across the country. There was this dynamic to separate illegal activity from politics and keeping the police police and not allowing them to be paid off. So even and then even through the the 1960s, this kind of reformation um, continued. So it, I found this this story interesting because the murder of one man kind of triggered a response in a whole city. And it's really sad to me that the prosecution, and this may or may not be true, this is my opinion, I'll say that right now, this is my opinion, that the prosecution didn't really seem all that interested in convicting his murderer. I feel like they would have gone a little, tried a little bit more to get, I mean, if, if everybody in town knew that Mary had a boyfriend and was, and was having sex with Monday, if everybody in town knew they had an unhappy marriage, why would anybody even let her feed him sleeping powders or whatever? I mean, I, I just am questioning what, what the dynamic here was with John literally flaunting his um, disobedience to town um, ordinances and, and building his casino right there in the middle of downtown. So I don't know. I thought it was interesting. I also thought it was interesting because the dynamics between Mary and Monday, I think she picked him because he was a black man and she knew that she could manipulate that fact if it came into play. I think that Mary um, almost certainly was responsible for the attack on her husband and 
almost certainly is responsible for his death. Just my opinion. Don't come after me for that. Just my opinion. But I also feel like the police held a huge responsibility in why this case was dismissed. If the, if Monday's conviction or confession rather had not been elicited under the threat of a mob hanging by a mob, I feel like the jury would have had no qualms in accepting it as truth. So just my opinion based on, you know, my opinion. <laughs> and it seems like the jury agreed with that. They felt like they could not convict Mary or Monday of the crime because his confession had not been properly obtained. Thank you for being patient with me and allowing me to split this story up into two weeks. I just felt like an hour was way too long for one video. I have the pictures up here again. This is John Sheedy. This is Mary Sheedy. And they're not really photographs. They're, you know, drawings from the newspaper. The next photograph is um, William Monday McFarland. And then I threw in one more picture for you. And this is a picture of John's headstone. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and listening to this long, long story. I have a couple of other videos here I've added that I think you might enjoy. And I've added a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel and you like true crime and crafting, I en encourage you to click that button. Leave me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment down below and have a really fabulous day.